Um, so yeah, so you might have noticed that the website looks a little different now. And uh, there's several reasons for the change. Um, but the biggest one is instead of calling it a textbook, now it's a set of notes. Um, and one of the reasons I like this is because you can just link to the specific topics like in the table. So, you know, for any given lecture, if you want to see what the note is, you can click it. Okay. For counting, there aren't necessarily notes for every single thing. So you'll have to refer to the lecture slides. Um, but for a lot of specific um, uh, subtopics, especially like, you know, related to the homework, um, you can see that there's some notes in the table. So you can sort of click those. And I highly recommend uh, that you look through these while working on the homework, okay? Because some of them are basically the same question, okay? There's also this one that's formatted slightly differently, but essentially goes over everything that you would have gone over last week um, and essentially what we'll do today. Um, it's not exactly formatted the same way, but it's essentially the same stuff and it was written just for this class as well, okay? Um, and yeah, the video or the slides from the last two lectures are also here. Sound good? Cool. Um, so yeah, homework six is due on Sunday um, at 11.59 p.m. And our next quiz is in class on Tuesday. Okay, all of the other quizzes have happened to be on Thursdays, but this one is on Tuesday, a week from today. It will be the same thing, 30 minutes in class, um, and it'll go over all counting topics, okay? Um, so today, I will essentially review and extend all of the stuff you saw last week. And Thursday, we will uh, do a guerrilla style walkthrough of homework six. Okay, so I highly recommend you at least attempt homework six before Thursday, um, but we will go through most of it, or if not the exact questions, very similar questions on Thursday, so we won't introduce anything new on Thursday. Um, then you'll have the weekend to submit the homework, the quiz will be on Tuesday, and then after the quiz on Tuesday, we'll start new material. Yeah. Well, see, the whole thing, like, you can, it's graded on uh, completeness, right? So any one question, if you skip it, like if all you do is skip that question, then it's not the end of the world. So like you can treat it as being optional, if that, if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, any other questions with what's going on logistically? I believe everything that you've submitted for this class has been returned to you on grade school, right? And again, if you have any questions about um, your progress in this class um, or just like, you know, um, when to take future classes, we have scheduled questions. I know phase one and that sort of stuff is slowly creeping up. Feel free to reach out. But towards the end of the class, once we finish all our material, I'll sort of talk more about that as well. Okay, so again, as I mentioned, we'll basically review everything you did last week. Um, but this is not like a substitute for last week's stuff. Also look at the slides from last week. Um, but yeah, let's get into counting. Okay, so the, the very first two fundamental rules you'll learn about when we talk about counting are the product rule and sum rule, okay? So the product rule applies when we need to make a sequence of K choices, when um, each, um, at each step, the choices are independent of the other steps. So you know the common example you hear of this is Suppose I have three pairs of pants and four t-shirts. How many outfits can I make? Well, it's three times four. Is that clear? And this is just a formalization of that. Okay, so the example I really like and I believe Ani went over it last week and it's a question on the homework and it's all, it also appears in the notes is determining the number of factors of some number. Okay, the reason I really like it is because it's an application of this product rule, but it also um, invokes things about uh, number theory that we saw before, and meaning uh, prime factorizations. Okay, so how can I find the number of factors that 48 has? Okay, well, 48's relatively small, and so if I really wanted to, I could sit there and say one, two, three, I think, yeah, four, five doesn't divide 48, six, eight, 12, 16, so on, so I could do that. But what if I gave you 48,000? Would you then go and enumerate um, all of them by hand? No, probably not, right? And so the key is that there's an easier way to do this. So this is too long. Too long slash too lazy. Okay, and so the, the whole point of this is we want to prime factor our number, right? So what's the prime factorization of 48? Can someone tell me? How can I write 48 as a product of prime factors?
Yeah. Good. Two to the four times three. Great. And now, when creating a factor of 48, we know it will look like 2 to the a times 3 to the b. Right? It will be 2 to the something times 3 to the something else. And we know this a is between 0 and 4, inclusive, and b is between 0 and 1, inclusive. Right? So to be more specific, the number of choices we have for a, a is either 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4, and b is either 0 or 1. So we can say the number of factors of 48 is the number of options we have for A times the number of options we have for B. In this case, it's 5 times 2, which is 10. And so if you look at the note that's linked on the website, you'll see that in general, you just take all of the exponents, add one to them, and multiply them. Right? And that tells you the number of factors. Okay, and then there are some extensions you can look at. How many factors does 48 have that are multiples of 12? Uh, and then you, you change the restrictions on A and B before, that it's just you know, between zero and four, but uh, in that case, you, you'd have to change it slightly. Um, and then another question that's on your homework is how many factors does whatever number have that are multiples of this um, and not multiples of this other number, right? So then you'd have to change both the lower bound and upper bound for A and B. Okay, so those are the sorts of things you'll get to play around with on the homework. So any questions with that example? Okay, another um, small extension to that is how many proper factors does a number have? So well, that's just factors other than one in itself, so you could just subtract two, right? Because this includes the case of two to the zero, three to the zero, which is just one, right? So you subtract one for that case, you can subtract one again for the case of 48 itself, okay? And then there's also the sum rule, which essentially tells you if you can break up your problem into a bunch of separate cases, um, that are disjoint, so uh, there's no intersection between the cases, then the total number of possibilities is the sum of the number of possibilities for each of those cases. Okay, pretty straightforward. Okay, I'm going to move slightly quickly um, just because there's a lot of things I want to cover today. Okay, then um, hopefully you went over the idea of the principle of inclusion and exclusion, which we did talk about probably in the first or second lecture of this class when talking about cardinalities of sets, right? Our problem was, suppose this is set A and this is set B, how do we count the number of elements in the union of A and B? Well, we count the number of elements in A, then add the number of elements in B, uh, but we notice the number of elements in the overlap were double counted, so we have to subtract that, okay? And so we get that the cardinality of A union B is the cardinality of A plus the cardinality of B minus the cardinality of the intersection, just so it's counted exactly once, okay? And we didn't really use this for any um, counting style questions at the beginning of the course because we weren't really talking about counting but now we can use the principle of inclusion exclusion for slightly uh, different problems okay so suppose there are 50 students at Billy High um, each student is enrolled in one of these two math classes um, or at least one of these two math classes right and suppose there's 40 students in calc 25 in linear algebra how many are in both well we're told that there are 50 students in total right so that's a union B and then we have the cardinalities of A and B individually, and we can just let X be the thing we're trying to solve for, which is the number of students in both. And we can pretty easily solve for X to be 15. Okay, and there's an extension of this, of course, on your homework when there are students that are not in either class, right? Um, and how, how does that play into this as well? Okay, but a question I want you to work on right now is determine the number of integers between 1 and 1,000 inclusive that are multiples of 3 or 5. Okay, number of integers that are uh, multiples of 3 or 5. Remember, or is not exclusive, right? So if it's both, that's also allowed. Okay, so I'll give you a couple minutes to try and figure this out with those uh, around you, and then we'll get back to it.
Okay, let's come back together. Okay, so there's a reason this slide came immediately after the principle of inclusion exclusion slide, right? It's because we count the number of integers that are multiples of three, and to that we add the number of integers that are multiples of five, but then we notice the number uh, of integers that are multiples of both three and five were counted both times, right? So you have to subtract that intersection. So let's find all of those pieces individually. So first, let's look at the number of integers that are multiples of three. Well, that goes from three times one, three times two, all the way until three times 333. So how many such integers are there? 333. Do the same thing for five. You go five times one, five times two, all the way until five times 200. There's 200 of those. And then there's 15. Okay, 15 times one, 15 times two. This one's a little uh, less simple to do mentally, but so I just use the calculator to figure it out. It's 15 times 66. That's the biggest one that's less than 1,000. This is actually 990. So there's 66 multiples of 15. Okay, so then um, the, the total we're looking for is 333 plus 200 minus 66. I think it's 467. Does that look okay? Is it 467? I don't know. It's been a long time since I did math. It is. Cool. So any questions with this? Cool. And then, of course, on your homework, there's an even further extension of this, right? How many integers are multiples of two and not multiples of three? Right? So you can play around with that. Okay? And you'll just have to use some combination of principle of inclusion and exclusion to figure out what to include and what not to include. Okay? But it's an extension of this. Yeah? I just tried to find the largest multiple of 15 that was under 1,000. Yeah. Cool. And so then we move into this idea of permutations and combinations, right? And so the permutation formula that you'll see is the number of ways to arrange k items selected from a group of n where order matters. Okay, so the main thing to remember is with a permutation, the order matters. Okay, um, and this is n factorial divided by n minus k factorial, right? And um, at some point you must have seen that n factorial is just n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 times 2 times 1. Okay, so for example, suppose I have five people um, named A, B, C, D, E, essentially, how many ways can I arrange them in a line? Well, the way I like to do this is draw five little uh, blanks. And so how many options do I have for the first person in line? Five, right? It could be any of these five people. Now, how many options do I have for the second person in line? Four. It could be anyone except for whoever I chose to be the first one. And similarly for the third person, it's three. It could be anyone except for the first two, then two, and one. And that gives me five factorial. Okay? Now, how about if I only want to select three of them to be in a line? Well, it's really the same thing. I have five options for the first, four for the second, three for the third, but there's no times two times one. So this ends up being five factorial divided by two factorial, which is just five factorial over five minus two factorial. Yeah, sorry. Like I said, it's been a while since I've you know, been here and doing math. Sound good? Okay, and so this, this example on its own is not the most difficult, but that doesn't mean you can't come up with difficult permutations questions, right? Cool, and so um, this example that we're gonna look at right now is really where a lot of permutations questions that you'll see out in the wild will take the form of, okay? And it's when they're repeated characters, okay? So how many permutations are there of the string dad? Okay, well actually, before I ask that, how many permutations are there of the string dog? Okay, and this really is the same problem as how many ways can I arrange three of these people in a line, 
right? There's three options for the first character, right? It's either D, O, or G. Two options for the second, it's whatever wasn't the first one, and one, which is whatever's remaining. So that's just three factorial. Is that clear? The number of permutations of the string doc. And now the question is, does the same thing apply to the string dad, right? Is it six? No, because right here, I have exhausted all of the permutations of dad, and there happens to only be three of them. And the reason is because there's this repeated D character, which we can't treat um, as being a unique character, right? Here, D, O, and G are all, uh, in dis or they're all distinguishable, right? They're all visibly different. So every time we change the order of them, it, uh, it, it, that, that's a separate uh, permutation. Whereas for these two D characters, um, they are indistinguishable. So for example, having D, A, and D, and the other D, A, and the other D, like, you can't tell that they're different, right? So they're really the same string. And so if we just said three factorial, it would be double counting, okay? And so the way I like to illustrate this is suppose we had um, unique characters. Suppose we really had D1, A, and D2. And if those were our characters, then yeah, we could find six different permutations. Right? We could have D1, A, D2, D2, A, D1, a, D1, D2, A, D2, D1, D1, D2, A, and D2, D1, A. But you see, the first two, the second two, and the third two are all the same thing, right? And so what we noticed is that the only difference between them is we've rearranged the repeated Ds, okay? And since there's two repeated characters, how many ways can we, we rearrange them? Two factorial. Right? If we instead we had D, A, D, D, then there would be three factorial repeated cases. Right? Because there's three factorial ways to arrange the repeated Ds. So what we do is we start off with three factorial and divide by the number of ways we can arrange the repeated characters. So divide by the number of ways to arrange repeated characters. Okay, and I'll admit the case where there's two repeated characters is annoying because you don't know if it's two or two factorial, um, but the example we're about to look at will be slightly different. But is this general premise okay? Cool, so now let's look at how many permutations are there of Mississippi. Right? This is a nice example because there's lots of characters and lots of different repeated characters. Okay, and so what I like to do in these questions is write vertically the word, um, but every time there's a repeated character, uh, put it in the same row. And so what I mean by that is, let's go through the word uh, from left to right. We have an M, I, S, and S. So this way it makes it easy to see how many of each character there are. Then another I, S, S. Then another I, P, P, and I. Okay, so this pretty easily tells me there's an one M, four I's, four S's, and two P's. Okay, so the question is, how many permutations are there of the string Mississippi? Well, how many characters are there total? Looks like 11, right? One plus four plus four plus two. So there's 11 total characters. So we'll start with 11 factorial. So total, um, like, I guess we can say num characters factorial. And now we need to divide by the repeated arrangements for each repeated character, okay? So the one, or for the M, it's not repeated, so it doesn't really change anything. But the I, there's four I's, okay? That means there's four factorial ways, or there's four factorial repeats for every unique combination. Okay, so we need to divide the movement of these I's, if that makes sense. Okay, and similarly, we have to do the same thing for the S's, because for every unique permutation of Mississippi, it was, we've counted it four factorial times, right? Uh, because we've allowed these S's to be unique when they're really not. So we need to divide by four factorial again, and then divide by two factorial, because we have the P's. So this is for the repeats of I, and this is the repeats of S, and repeats of P. So is 11 factorial divided by four factorial, four factorial, two factorial. 
Is that clear? Any questions with this? Okay, so while we're on the topic of permutations, how many times does a substring dog appear in all permutations of baby dog? How do you think we could figure this out? Yeah, you can treat the substring dog as a single character. Okay, so I can write this as B A B Y, and then I can box D O G. So instead of treating it as if there are seven characters, we can say that there are just five characters because the D O and G all have to be next to each other. So there's really five characters, but don't forget we still have to divide by the repeats for the Bs. So we still have to divide by two factorial. So we can treat dog as a single character. Is that clear? So we block it together. There's another follow-up we can look at though. So a follow-up. And the question is, what if, there, how many times does there do the characters D, O, and G appear next to each other, but not necessarily in that order? Okay? So what I'm asking now is, how many times does DGO appear, or DOG, or ODG, right? So the characters D, O, and G are adjacent, but not necessarily in that order. Is that clear, the question? So how many times do DOG appear? Okay, and so we'll start off with the answer we had before, 5 factorial over 2 factorial. But now, for each arrangement we had before, we can scramble the order of D, O, and G, right? And how many ways can we permute the characters D, O, and G? 3 factorial, right? So we take our previous result, and for each previous result, we can scramble D, O, and G 3 factorial ways. So we just multiply our previous thing by 3 factorial. So essentially, like if before I had A, Y, B, B, D, O, G, this can be replaced with the same thing, but D, G, O, O, G, D, O, D, G, G, O, D, G, D, O. And I can do that for every one of the five factorial divided by two factorial original permutations. Is that clear? Yeah. So yeah, that, that's a great follow-up because then there would be a repeated character inside the A and outside the A. And I believe that's a question on the homework. So I don't want to say too much now, but um, we'll take that up on Thursday if that's okay. But yeah, that's a great follow-up. What if it was DAG? Then there would be a repeated A, like there would be a is repeated, but one would be inside the block and one would be outside the block. Okay? So you should think about that. Um, and if we don't talk about it today, uh, we're not going to talk about it today, but we'll talk about it on Thursday. Okay? And then yet another follow-up, which also exists in the homework, is how many permutations exist of baby dog where the characters D, O, and G appear in that order, but not necessarily next to each other. And so what I mean by that is how many uh, permutations of this word exist where it looks like D and then some number of characters, then O and then some number of characters, and then G and then some number of characters. Okay, and some number of characters before. Okay? And this is an extension of the idea of stars and bars, which we'll talk about um, towards the end of lecture today. Uh, but one of these exact examples appears either on the homework or a question that we'll take up on Thursday. Okay, so this is sort of all tied together. Okay, um, I'll erase that from here for now. But is everyone okay with these kinds of ideas? Okay, and then uh, just, just to make you aware of it, another sort of extension of this would be how many 
three letter, or, uh, like how many three letter strings can you make using the characters of Baby Dog? And then you have to consider like what if I have repeated uh, the repeated B's or not? And there's a bunch of casework that you'll have to do. And that's similar to the question in the homework where I think you have to find the number of numbers that look like one blank blank one, for example. Uh, or numbers that start with the one and have two ones. But I think that's a question in the homework. So it's a similar idea, casework. But is this all okay? Cool. Um, and the last little example that I want to look at is how many ways can I seat five people around a circular dinner table? Okay, and so the best way is just to look at a picture. That's not really a circle, but whatever. So, okay, A, B, C, D, and E. Okay, so the easy answer would just to be, just to say, five factorial. Five options for the first spot, four for the next, and so on and so forth. But can someone point out the flaw in that? Why is it not just five factorial? And like, just assume that all of the seats at the table are the same. And all we care about is the arrangement itself, not the seats specifically. Yeah. Yeah, you could just rotate the circle and the same people would be sitting next to the same people. And so that's being overcounted. So for example, that this is equivalent, you could say, to like C, D, E, A, and B. Because the same people are sitting next to the same people. So in these circular cases, like how many ways can you see N people around a circular dinner table? How many ways can I rotate this? Well, five, right? Because who could be in the top spot? It could be A, B, C, D, or E. And I could just rotate it five times. So in this, it's actually five factorial over five, which is four factorial. Is that clear? And so a way to think of that is say, fix one person to be like in one specific spot. How many ways can you arrange where everyone else is? And then you get four factorial. Right? And you wouldn't have to deal with this overcount. Right? You could say, fix A will be in this spot, and then now you just arrange everyone around A. Four, three, two, one, and that also gives four factorial. So, any questions with this example? So, we already have a lot of different examples that we can look at in counting without even bringing up the idea of choosing. Or, I mean, we're sort of talking about choosing, but without talking about the idea of n choose k. Okay, so that's what we'll talk about now. So, before, when we wanted to select three of A, B, C, D, and E, the like, analogy I used was, how many ways can we arrange them to be in a line? Right? And we said, there would be five for the first person, four for the second, three for the third. Okay? And then, as a result, we would say A, B, and E, and B, E, and A are two different arrangements, because in a line, it matters who's first, who's second, and who's third. Right? And so we said, there's five times four times three, which gives you five factorial over two factorial, different ways I can arrange that. Okay? But now the extension to that is, how many ways can I select three people from A, B, C, D, and E where the order doesn't matter? All I care about is who I have selected, right? And then now, we should look at like, what five factorial over two factorial counts, and we see, oops, we see that each um, selection of three unique people was counted six times, right? We counted A, B, E, A, E, B, B A E B A I guess B E A E A B and E B A right? Those are all really the same thing. It's the same three people, and since we don't care about order, we just care about the people themselves. We've overcounted six times for every actual unique arrangement. So what we need to do is take our five factorial over two factorial, and divide it again by three factorial because we've counted every case three factorial too many times. Is that clear? So now this number and it happens to be equal to 10, is the number of ways you can select three people from a group of five where order does not matter. You just care about how many ways you can select the people themselves. Is this clear? Okay, so the order doesn't matter. You divide by the three factorial, okay, to get rid of these double-counted cases. Okay, and so let's generalize this. 
So the number of ways to select k items from a group of n where order doesn't matter is what we say is n choose k. <coughs> okay? And this is defined to be n factorial divided by n minus k factorial times k factorial. Okay? And we sort of got this by taking the permutation formula p of n and k and divided that further by k factorial. But nobody really uses this p of n choose k, or n comma k thing. Usually, um, we'll write everything in terms of n choose k. All right? Okay? And so, um, and this is also referred to as the binomial coefficient, which is an idea we'll start talking about probably in a week today after your quiz. And um, what we'll start doing when we talk about combinatorial proofs is looking at different identities or different expressions um, involving different n choose k's um, that are equal to one another, okay? And the very first one you'll see is this one, is the fact that n choose k and n choose n minus k are both equal. If I look at n choose n minus k, it'll just reverse the order of these two, but multiplication is commutative, so this doesn't really change anything, right? Um, and why is that? Well, it's because... Over here, selecting three people to be in my group is the same as selecting two people to not be in the group, right? So five choose three and five choose two should be the same thing. Is that clear? So selecting people to be in the group, the same as selecting n minus k people to not be in the group. Sound good? Cool. <coughs> so here's an example. Suppose I want to form a team of three basketball players from a pool of 10, okay? How many ways can I do this if there are no positions? All people are equal. So it's like modern basketball, no positions. How many ways can this be done? Order doesn't matter. Well, it's 10 choose three, right? I have 10 pos possible players. Since there's no positions, they're all essentially the same. So it's 10 choose 3. Is that clear? Okay. Now how is it different if there must be a guard, forward, and center? How is that now different? Yeah. Would it just be uh, 10 factorial over 3 uh, Very close. Seven. Yeah, 10 factorial over 7 factorial. So this... Part B is really a permutation of these three because it matters who I select to be the guard, who I select to be the forward, and who I select to be the center. Okay? So I can even write like this if you want. Guard, forward, center, 10, 9, 8. Okay? Suppose, um, you know, well, whatever. We can use LeBron, LB, KB and MJ. Okay, suppose those are three unnamed basketball players. Okay? In the first um, case, all I care is that I have these three people. Okay? But in the second case, this is one unique um, ordering. Like guard is LeBron, forward, whatever, and center, random guy. Okay? Like that's one unique ordering. And then another unique ordering would be if I had the same positions, copy, paste, okay, like this would be different than if I had this. Even though they're the same three people, the positions are different, right, so I have to count these as different cases. Is that clear? So these are different. With no order, all we care about is the three people we choose themselves. Whereas in the, uh, when we have specifically a guard, forward, and center, it matters who I select at each of these positions. Okay? So here, it would just be 10 times 9 times 8. But you can really think of this as just being, first, let me choose the three people. So 10 choose 3. And then, now how many ways can I assign them to positions? Well, I have three options for who can be the guard, two options for who can be the forward, and one option for who can be the center. So I multiply this by 3 factorial. Okay, so this is really starting with the choosing formula and working backwards, right? And this is, a, this is just a consequence of n choose k times k factorial oops, being equal 
to the permutation formula. Right? It's just working backwards. But since most, usually most people are more familiar with n choose k, and just more identities are known about n choose k, oftentimes you can start, that, start with that and then multiply it to get to the permutation. Is that clear? So any questions with this? Okay. And so now here's a slightly more involved example. Suppose I want to select eight kids from a group of eight boys and nine girls. Okay? Side note, what's the total number of ways I can do this? The total number of ways I can select eight kids from eight boys and nine girls. It's 17 choose eight, right? Because in total, if there's no restrictions on how many boys or girls I should take, well, it doesn't really matter that they're boys or girls. There's just 17 people total. I choose eight of them. Okay? But now to be a little more specific, how many ways can I select exactly three boys and exactly five girls? Well, the number of ways to select three boys is eight choose three, right? Because there's eight of them. And the number of ways to select five girls is nine choose five. And then we just use the product rule, right? Num the number of um, ways we can choose the boys times the number of ways we can choose the girls. Those are independent of one another. And so we multiply them. And so we're left with 8 choose 3 times 9 choose 5. Is that okay? Okay, and so the follow-up to that is how many ways can I select at least 4 boys to form this group? Okay, so I'll give you a couple minutes to discuss about this. I really want you to talk about this with the people near you. But how many ways can I select at least 4 boys? Okay, cool. Let's come back together. Okay. So there's two ways I could approach this. Okay? And so the first, the more direct way, is I recognize at least four boys means four or five or six or seven or eight. So what I can do is find the number of ways I can select four boys, add that to the number of ways I can select five, add that to the number of ways I can select six, seven, and eight. So four or five or six, or seven, or eight. The other way is by what we call complementary counting. I can start with the total and subtract the number of ways I can select zero, one, two, or three boys. Is that clear? And those are the exact same. I can start with everything and get rid of the ones that are not at least four or directly count the ones that are at least four. Is that clear? So total minus zero or one or two or three. Is that clear? I can start with the total and get rid of the number of ways to select zero, one, two, or three boys, or just directly count the number of ways I can select four, five, six, seven, eight. 
Is that okay? Cool. And so let's do that. And so this way is the direct way. Okay? So I add the number of ways you can select four, five, six, seven, and eight. And in each case, if I select K boys, I need to select eight kids total, so I select eight minus K girls. Right? So if I select four boys, I get four girls. Five boys, it's three girls. Six boys, it's two girls. Seven and one. And eight and zero. Is that clear? And since these are all disjoint cases, like I can't select four boys and five boys at the same time, so there's no overlap, I just add all. Is this okay? And so if we want to look at the complementary method, I could say this is also equal to the total, which was 17 choose eight, minus the number of ways to choose zero, one, two, or three boys, right? So I could have eight choose zero, nine choose eight, eight choose one, nine choose seven, eight choose two, nine choose six, and eight choose three, nine choose five. Is that clear? Cool. Any questions with this? Great. And so now I have a relatively involved example, so I really want you to um, try each of these questions on your own for a minute or so before we take them all up. Okay? So we're given a standard deck of cards, which, you know, in a standard deck of cards, there's 52 cards. Each card has two properties, so <coughs> it has a suit. Right, so it's either the spades, clubs, hearts, or diamonds, and it has a value, okay? Ace, two through 10, and then jack, queen, king. Okay, so each card has these two properties. And in a hand of cards, the order in which you have the cards doesn't matter, right? You can just move them around. Okay, so what's the total number of five card hands in poker? <coughs> 52 choose five, right? There's 52 total cards. I can select five of them to be in my hand. Okay? So it's a total number of five card hands. So actually, I want you to do three first before you work on two. Okay, so I'll give you a couple minutes. Work on number three and then work on number two because three is slightly easier. Okay, so for three, we want to figure out the number of five card hands that include a four of a kind. Okay, so like four, one, four aces and the two or like four jacks and a seven or something like that. Is there a question over there? No? Okay. So work on number three and then attempt number two. Okay, and I'll give you a couple minutes and then we'll come back together. Okay, take care. That's okay. That's okay. Feel better. Yeah, well, there's only one card, like, given one, like, a specific card, a, a value in suit, there's only one of them. Right, right, so. Yeah.
Okay, I'll take up three really quick, and then I'll let you keep working on number two. Because hopefully, if, if three makes sense, then two hopefully will become better. Okay, so we want a sequence that looks like A, 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 B. Okay, so how many ways can we do this? Does anyone have an approach? Yeah. There are 13 values. Right. Each value is only one four of a kind. Right. And so for each of those values, you choose one of the 48 remaining parts to the last. Okay, so you're saying it's 13 times 48. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, so let's, let's um, uh, break that down. So first, ignore the B. How many ways can we just choose a four of a kind? Well, we're not choosing anything specific about the suit, right? Because we just select a value and we take all four of its uh, different suits, right? Like we select three and then we get all four of the threes. So the first question is how many different face values are there? Well, there's 13. And you, know, you can also write that as 13 choose one, but 13. So what we're doing is choosing um, face value of A. 13 ways we can do that. And so now, we've taken all four of the cards of that value. And we just want um, any one of the remaining cards. So there's two ways we could look at this. <coughs> well, one, we, we, first we choose the value of the remaining card, and we, we wiped out all of the, the first one. We wiped out all of the A's. So now how many face values are remaining? 12, so we choose one of those. And then now we need to select a suit for that. So there's four of those options, so it's four. But equivalently, you could just say, well, there, was, there were uh, four cards of that face value. We removed all four of them. Our remaining card could be one of the remaining 52 minus four, which is 48. But 12 times four is 48, so it really doesn't change anything. Two equivalent uh, interpretations. So is that okay? So first I select the face value of the four of a kind. And then I select the suit and face value of the remaining card. Is that okay? Okay, and so with that, I'll give you another minute or so to work on number two. I wanted it to be back from break, but that was taken, so it's breaking back. Okay, so how many five card hands are there that include exactly one pair? And so the key word is exactly, like you have to make sure that there's only one pair, so not two, there can't be three, but you have to ensure somehow that there's only one pair. So does anyone have an approach? Yeah. For each of the 13 numbers, yeah. exactly six pairs. Okay. Okay, okay you're, you're on the right track. And so the, the first part is exactly right. So for the AA, there's 13 possible face values. So we have 13 choose one. And then we need to choose two of, those fa uh, two of the suits, right? So that's four choose two because there's four possible suits. We're selecting two of them, okay? So I have four choose two. Is that clear? 
And so now what we need to do is figure out how many ways we can select the remaining three cards. But what we need of the remaining three cards is that they can't be the same suit. Okay, so B, C, and D, or sorry, not the same suit. They can't be the same face value. So B, C, and D <coughs> have to all be different and they can't be equal to A as well. Is that clear? And so what we can do is we have 12 remaining face values that we haven't touched. Of those, we can select three. Right, and again, face value is just the number or the jack, queen, king, ace. So we've selected one of 13 to be A. And then of the four possible suits, we selected two. And now for B, C, and D, there are 12 possible uh, face values. We select three of them, one for B, one for C, one for D. But again, order doesn't matter. So that's why we just have 12 choose three. And then now for each of B, C, and D, we need to choose their suit. Okay? And there's four options for B, four options for C, and four options for D. Right? Because the suit could all be the same. They just have to be different numerical values. Is that clear? So I could just write this as 4 cubed. Okay, so to be a little more descriptive, here we could have um, face val of A, suits of A, face val of B, C, D, and suits of B, C, and D. Is everyone okay with that? And so a question that you might have is, instead of doing this 12 choose 3 times 4 cubed, why, can, why can't we just do 48 choose 3? Right? Because we ignore all the cards of the value of A. Right? Even though we only selected two of them, there's still two more. So why can't we just say 48 choose 3? Yeah. Yeah, like what if you end up selecting, like pretend what if in the beginning you selected two aces. If you did 48 choose 3, it would allow you to select two of any other card. Right, so this way, we deliberately force it so that B, C, and D are all different face values. Is that clear? Yeah. 48 times 44 times 40. Um, hmm. Yeah, well, you... You would have to do that divided by three factorial for the arrangements, I believe. But yeah, like if you look at 12 choose three, it ends up being 12 times 11 times 10 times nine factorial divided by nine factorial, three factorial, right? The nine factorials cancel and we're multiplying that by four cubed, but multiplying that by four cubed is the same as 48 times 44 times 40 over three factorial. Because again, the order of the cards doesn't matter. Right? It could be like B, C, D, and D, C, B are the same thing. But yeah, good. So any questions with this? And so the reason it's so complicated at the end is because we need to deliberately make sure that we don't select another pair. Okay? Let's look at four, five, and six. We'll walk through them together. So how many five-card hands are there that have a straight, where, which means all the card values or the face values are consecutive? Okay? And so the first question is, how many straights exist? Okay? And I believe the answer is there's nine. Okay, and what are they? Well, we could go ace through nine. Well, you could either have ace at the beginning or at the end. It doesn't really matter. You have ace through nine, two through ten, three through um, whatever, jack, four through queen, five through king. Um, oh, wait, what am I saying? Never mind. It should be five, six, seven, eight. Okay, those are the nine. But you can start with ace and go through five, you know, and so on and so forth until you get to nine through king. Is that clear? 
And so there's nine possible uh, sequences that are straight. Okay, so we know we're going to start with the nine. And now for each of those straights, the five cards we select, they could, each of them could be of any suit. Is that clear? Right, like there's no restriction on what the suits have to be. So we, can, we have four options for the suit of the first card, four options for the suit of the second card, four for the third, four for the fourth, and four for the fifth. Gives us nine times four to the five. Is that okay? So we first figured out the number of straights that exist. And then for each of them, there's four to the five ways you can assign the suits to those cards. Is that okay? Okay. And the number five is an extension of this. How many five card hands are there that are straight flush, which means that they're um, a straight and all the cards are the same suit? So we know we're going to start with the nine. Yeah. Um, I have a question really quick. What sure. about like ten guys? Um, I'm just assuming you can't do that for now. Yeah, I, 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 I realized like this wouldn't be a good like quiz question. It's more of like a walkthrough question. But yeah, like if you were to allow that, then you'd have to have ten. But yeah. Okay. So. If we're looking at straight flushes, where it's a straight and all the cards are the same suit, well, there's nine possible straights. And now, it's not that we have four to the five options, but it's really, we just select one of the four suits, because we know all of the cards will have the same suit, right? So we just select the suit once, and we're done. So any questions with the difference between four and five? Okay, in four, each of the five cards could be different suits, whereas in five, um, they all have to be in the same suit. So you just select the suit ones. Okay, and lastly, six, how many five card hands are there where all the cards are the same suit? Well, here, again, we have two choices. Well, one, first, we choose the suit itself. And now once the suit is chosen, there's 13 possible face values. We choose five of them. Okay, so we have four choose one times 13 choose five. Is that okay? So first, we choose the suit. There's four possibilities. We choose one of them, and then we choose the number of face values. It's 13 total. Choose five. Is this okay? Any questions with this? Okay. So I know it's a lot to take in at once, but again, the slides will be posted, and I highly recommend you just look through it and try and work through these examples on your own, and that will really help um, make sure you understand. Okay, and so now there's the idea of stars and bars. Okay, how many ways can I distribute 12 pieces of candy to three of my friends is the way I like to introduce it. Okay, and so some clarifying notes. My three friends are distinguishable, right? They're all visibly different. Um, hopefully my friends are different people. And we'll assume the pieces of candy are all different, right? Um, like if you have like all the pieces of candy, like there's no difference between the ones you get, okay? So th those are two uh, key clarifying points, okay? And the way we'll model this situation is with stars and bars, okay? With stars, they literally mean asterisks, um, like, you know, if you type the asterisk character, and bars being those vertical separators, okay? And I'll use this to model different situations, okay? So this first one that I've written over here represents a case where my first friend gets two pieces of candy, Second friend gets six pieces, and fourth, uh, third friend gets four pieces. Okay, the bars divide between friend, on, like between two friends, if that makes sense. Okay, so this represents friend one, friend two, and friend three. Okay, similarly, the second setup represents friend one getting one star, uh, one piece of candy, friend two getting zero, and friend three getting eleven. I guess they're hungry. Is that clear? So any questions with what this picture represents? It sort of divides up 
how many pieces of candy go to each of my friends. Okay? And so if our question is, what's the total number of ways that can distribute three pieces of candy to my 12 friends? It's really just finding the number of permutations of this string. Is that clear? Because each permutation of this represents a different, um, a different distribution of number of candies to friends, right? And so if I find all the permutations of this and the number of them, I found the number of different ways I can distribute the candy. Is that clear? Okay, so let's look at it. So in this case, we happen to have 12 stars and two bars. Okay? And so if we treat this like a string where we have 12 A's and two B's, well, we first take the total number of characters factorial, so in this case, 14 factorial, and divide by the number of repeats for each character. Right? So there's 12 repeated stars and two repeated bars, so we divide by 12 factorial, 2 factorial. Um, but this looks very similar to the choosing formula, which is because it is. You can think of this as being, well, I have 14 characters, choose two of them to be stars. The remaining will all be bars. Or sorry, choose two of them to be bars, the remaining will all be stars. Right? Or equivalently, I have 14 characters, choose 12 of them to be stars, the remaining will all be bars. Is that clear? Okay. And so, in general, the number of ways you can ar arrange n identical items, so the candies are identical, into k distinguishable bins, so I guess your friend's stomachs are the bins, is n plus k minus 1, choose k minus 1. Okay? But if we want to use the stars and bars analogy, the one thing we have to keep in mind is the number of bars is bins minus one, right? I said I have three friends, but I only have two bars. And that's because you only need two bars to, uh, you know, depict the arrangements for three people, right? Because you don't need the endpoints. Is that clear? I just used two bars, but I was able to show an arrangement for what I gave to three friends. So the number of bars is the number of bins minus one. But K bins just means K minus one bars. Um, then, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. Um, so you can write this as stars plus bars choose bars. Okay? Or equivalently, stars plus bars choose stars. Is that okay? So this is only in the very specific case where the items themselves are identical, but the things you're inserting them into, I guess, are not identical. Is this okay? And so, you can also represent this algebraically. So suppose I have the question, determine the number of non-negative integer solutions to this equation. Okay, if all I showed you was this, before today or before, whatever, two weeks ago, probably would not have thought of counting in stars and bars. Right? But that, that's what's so interesting about it. It really has, this has nothing to do with, uh, like, I don't know, calculus or the other types of math you would have seen before. This is really just a counting question. Right? You can think of each of x1, x2, x3, x4, and x5 as being a friend, and we're just distributing 25 pieces of candy to them. Right? So the total number of non-negative integer solutions, right? and non-negative just means each xi is greater than or equal to zero, the number of non-negative integer solutions to this is just the number of ways I can distribute 25 pieces of candy to four friends. Or to five friends, sorry. Is that clear? So this is the same as distributing 25 candies to five friends. Is that clear? And so it's stars plus bars, choose bars, or stars plus bars, choose stars. Is that okay? Cool. And 
So the follow-up to that is, I, here we're allowing each xi to be equal to zero, like greater than or equal to zero, right? And so like the candy interpretation of that is here, I said my second friend, no, you ate too much candy before, you're getting zero candy, right? But what if we want to restrict it so that everyone gets at least one piece of candy? Okay, so that's a new problem. How do we do this such that everyone gets at least one piece of candy? And so before we had that each of our variables was non-negative. But now we want it so that they're each strictly greater than zero or equivalently greater than or equal to one, right? Because they have to be integers. So if it's strictly greater than zero, it's just greater than or equal to one. Is that clear? We're just looking at the first one. Okay? And so what we can do algebraically is create this new variable xi prime, okay, or we, you could even call it yi if you wanted to, which I get by subtracting 1 from xi. And then now, since I had xi is greater than or equal to 1, xi minus 1 is greater than or equal to 0, so xi prime is greater than or equal to 0, which allows me to use the xi primes in the equation I had before. Right, so now use setup from previous slide. Is that clear? If I take all of my xi, so x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, subtract one from them, and call that xi prime one, or like x1 prime, x2 prime, x3 prime, x4 prime, and x5 prime. Now they they have the same constraint as we had before, right? And so I can use it. Um, I can use the same formula I had before, right? So what I'm saying is the number of positive integer solutions to this, x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus x4 plus x5 is 25, is the same as the non-negative integer solutions, the number of them, to x1 prime plus x2 prime plus blah, 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 and is equal to 20 because I've subtracted 1 from each of my variables. So if I subtract 5 on the left, I subtract 5 on the right as well. Is that clear? I've subtracted five from both sides. So now I have my problem in terms of these new variables. I did the substitution. And now I just need to find the number of non-negative integer solutions to this, which I already know how to do. Now I can just use the same stars plus bars, choose bars. Right here, how many stars are there? 20. How many bars are there? Four. Choose bars. 20 plus four, choose four. Okay? And so in general, the number of positive integer solutions in this case, where instead of having five x's, you have k x's, is n minus 1, choose k minus 1. But right here we had 24, choose 4, when we had five x's and it summed to 25. We subtracted 1 from the total, 1 from the number of x's, and that's what we have. Okay, and notice the only difference is that in this case, we don't allow any of them to be empty. Is that okay? And so, another way we can think of this, and so suppose I, like the, the new problem is, how many ways can I distribute small pieces of candy to three of my friends, such that they all get one piece? What I could do is, knowing that they all get one piece, I can just give them their one piece of candy in the beginning, and so now I just have nine pieces of candy left to distribute. And I can solve the same problem of how many ways can I distribute nine pieces of candy to my friends. And it's okay if some of them get zero because I already gave them their one in the beginning. Is that clear? And that's the exact same thing we're doing over here. We subtract one because we're already assuming they all get one in the beginning. Is that clear? And so um, I give them each one piece to begin with. And so now we have nine pieces remaining. So we have stars being nine, bars being two. And then I look at nine plus two, choose two, which works out to be the exact same as what I found before. Is that clear? And so this 11 choose 2 comes from n minus 1, choose k minus 1 from last slide. Is this okay? And so there's actually a further follow-up um, in the homework where I think one of the 
like it, you're given a set of variables, but one of them is required to be like greater than or equal to two or something. And then another one, like X, I'm just making this up, but X4 has to be less than three, for example. And so you have to look at a, uh, some different cases there. Right? So the greater than um, situation, you can just subtract two and you'll essentially do what we just did here. But in the case where the variable is upper bounded by something, then you have to look at three destroyed cases. Okay, so highly encourage you to play around with that before Thursday, but that's definitely one of the questions we'll look at on Thursday. Okay? Um, and so now, with the remaining time, I want to start talking about the idea of Pascal's triangle. So I recognize I'm probably not going to finish everything today, but um, I'd say, let's say, the first third to half of Thursday will be finishing up this stuff, and the rest will be going over homework six problems. Okay? And so Pascal's triangle... Um, how many people have seen this before? Most people, right? And so it's sort of this recursive sequence and the way numbers in it are generated is by adding two adjacent numbers and their sum goes below it. Is that clear? So you start with row zero up here. Um, so row zero has one element, row one has two elements, row 100 has 101 elements, so on and so forth, right? And so you just take the sum of two adjacent numbers and it comes below. Okay, nice, simple, innocent, but it turns out in Pascal's triangle, there are many, many <coughs> uh, cool patterns that we'll start to look at now, okay? And so the first is that the numbers are actually just uh, the combinatorial coefficients that we've seen before. So the zero throw is just zero, choose zero. First row is one, choose zero, one, choose one. Then we have two, choose zero, two, choose one, two, choose two, so on and so forth, okay? So if someone says, what's the... 53rd element in the 102nd row, well, just 102, choose 53. Choose 53. Is that okay? So these are the exact same thing. Okay, um, but let's look at this one for a second because I think it's a little easier to see some of the patterns. What are some patterns that people see? What are some patterns that people see? It doesn't have to be something crazy. Yeah. This is diagonal where the numbers are just the natural numbers and you can Yep. So this diagonal, or equivalently this diagonal, are just the natural numbers. Okay. You also might notice that it's symmetric. Right? Anything else? Yeah. Yeah, so that's true, but that, that's sort of how it's generated. But yeah, that is true. Okay, so good. So you're, you're talking about this diagonal. And so there's a specific term for this. It's called the set of triangular numbers. What does the triangular numbers mean? It tells you um, the number of dots you need to make a triangle with uh, that height. Okay, so for example, to make a triangle with height one, you need a single dot. A triangle with height two, you need three dots. A triangle with height three, you need one, two, three, four, five, six dots. The triangle with height four, you need 10 dots. Well, I take all the ones before and just add four to it, right? Is that clear? So it's just an extension of that pattern. And so what you might actually notice is that that has to do with the sum of the natural numbers up until that point. Right, so the sum of the first one natural numbers is one. Sum of the first two natural numbers is three. Sum of the first three natural numbers is six. Sum of the first four natural numbers is 10, so on and so forth. Okay, and so actually, I mean, we'll, oops, okay, just to make it a little more clear. 
got that here and this here and this here and so the property we just looked at actually tells you that the sum of 1 plus 2 plus dot 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 plus n remember we did that whole thing where we did telescoping sums and whatnot well that really just tells us that it's n choose 2 because this purple diagonal that I have is the row number choose 2 well, it's really the row number choose n minus 2. But since it's symmetric, it's the same as being the row number choose 2. Because right? I equivalently could have just looked at this diagonal. And by definition, they're the exact same because this triangle is symmetric. Right? So this diagonal over here is the row number choose 2. Is that clear? Okay, and so that's sort of just to get you started thinking about the idea of Pascal's triangle. Um, here are some of the more some more properties. Um, so, for example, there's the hockey stick identity, which um, probably easier if I just show you here. You can sort of make a hockey stick, and the like tail. I, I don't play hockey, but like the tail part of it is the sum of everything on the shaft. Okay, so for example, the sum of 1, 3, and 6 is 10. The sum of 1, 4, and 10 is 15. The sum of 1, 4, 10, and 20 is 35. So on and so forth. So you can make this hockey stick shape. Oops. And the number at the bottom, 35, is the sum of everything on the shaft. So that's called the hockey stick. Is that clear? So these are the things we'll start talking about. Um, and finish talking about on Thursday, and then the rest of Thursday will take up all the questions, not all, but some subset of the questions in homework six, and then you should be good to go for your quiz on Tuesday.